There's already been a lot of discourse about the Netflix documentary The Social Dilemma, which explores the dangers of social media as told largely by former tech employees and executives. It's been called the single most lucid, succinct, and profoundly terrifying analysis of social media ever created. And, uh, I don't know. I don't know about all that. Most of the discussion about The Social Dilemma has focused on the documentary parts of the documentary, but there's also a fictional narrative embedded within it that aims to demonstrate the movie's main points with the story of a generic suburban family torn apart by their cell phones. It's the most ridiculous Black Mirror bullshit, and I love it so much, and I want to talk about it. So, in this video, I'm mostly going to just ignore the whole critically acclaimed documentary thing, and instead take a deep dive into the absurd fiction within it. The family starts out already very conflicted about their cell phones. The oldest of the three siblings, Cass, is the only member of the family who doesn't have a cell phone. She's very smart, she reads smart person books like The Age of Surveillance Capitalism, we should all look up to her. The mom does have a cell phone, but she's been listening to Cass's concerns about modern technology and is growing increasingly worried. She's been emailing her children clips from The View about deleting social media. On the other hand, the youngest sister, 11-year-old Isla, is constantly on her cell phone doing the snips. I have like a thousand more snips to send before dinner. She just can't stop snipping. Can't look up from the snips for even a second. And then there's Ben, who's the focal character of the narrative. And we can learn a lot about Ben by looking at all of the data that his cell phone is collecting from him. The documentary represents social media data through these, like, sci-fi screens. So you can see that Ben is a cisgendered male heterosexual single in your area. He's shorter than average, affluent, scared of snakes. I love that they call all these deducements, some real Sherlock Holmes stuff going on here. He starts out the movie feeling nervous and lonely, but not very deviant or asleep. Is asleep really part of your mood? Okay. And then his interests include pro soccer, new music, teen dude how to style hair, why do British call soccer football, and epic fails. He spends a lot of time on epicfails.live. All of the websites Ben visits, by the way, have really weird domains. Like, there are no .coms, no .orgs, it's just like .club, .live, .guide, .zone. Even though this whole story is about Ben's social media use, there are no social media sites, there's no Facebook, no YouTube, no Twitter, just soccer, hair, and epic fails. And I've gotta say from the start, the weirdness of Ben's internet browsing does make me question to what extent the lessons we draw from this narrative can even apply to us. Like, if such basic aspects of the structure of the internet and the ways teenagers use it feel so off, then what exactly does the world of the social dilemma have to offer? The gimmick throughout this whole narrative is that Ben's social media algorithms are being personified as three Vincent Carthizers and an inside-out style control center. There's purple shirt Vincent Carthizer, that's engagement. He's basically Ben's recommendation algorithm, deciding what posts to prioritize in his feed. Then there's green shirt Vincent Carthizer, that's growth. He wants to grow the user base, so he's focused on Ben's social life, sending him notifications about his friends. And there's yellow shirt Vincent Carthizer, advertising, who's bringing in the cash for this whole operation. Together, these three Vincents are taking in all this data from Ben in order to create a predictive model of his behavior, represented by a creepy Ben hologram, and then use that model to generate recommendations and notifications that will keep him on his cell phone for the most time possible, looking at the most ads possible, with no concern for his well-being. I love the articles they recommend him, by the way. They're recommending him this terrifying article called Human Graveyard Discovered. Oh no, not a human graveyard. Any other kind of graveyard would be fine, but a graveyard full of dead humans? How horrifying! And then there's rare sighting of celebrity. There's nothing I love more than clicking on articles with vague titles and stock photo thumbnails. The extremely powerful recommendation algorithm knows exactly what to show to get me to click. This way of personifying social media algorithms as three sci-fi Vincents emphasizes their agency and decision-making power, which totally makes sense to me. I mean, these kinds of algorithms learn and make decisions about what to show users largely without human intervention. I think they can be under 
understood as having a kind of machine agency. The thing is, these algorithms already have that agency without being personified. Like, if I just scroll through YouTube, that algorithmic decision-making power is already at play in deciding what videos to show on my feed. So why do we even need the metaphor here? Why are we representing this very real algorithmic agency as science fiction human agency? One reason that comes to mind, especially when you remember that the rest of this documentary is a bunch of interviews with former tech executives, is that by creating this villainous trio, it obscures the role of the actual humans involved in shaping these algorithms. The corporate actors who created the Vincent told them to prioritize time spent on feed and number of ads shown over anything else. We have no indication that the Vincents were created. They simply exist in their parallel dimension. They're an otherworldly magic. In the documentary portion of the documentary, social media algorithms are repeatedly described in that way, as magic. Have we all fallen under some kind of spell? Is this the last generation of people that are gonna know what it was like before this illusion took place. And then there's also this quote, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And then this dude Tristan does some magic tricks. And yeah, Ben's Vincents are portrayed as magic. Rather than his cell phone use being understood as an interaction between Ben and his algorithms, Ben is one-sidedly acted upon by beings in another world who he can't see and doesn't know exist. I want to look in particular at two moments that illustrate the immense magical power of the Vincents. In the first, Ben is texting Rebecca, a girl at his school who he has a crush on. Okay, Rebecca received it, and she is responding. I let Ben know that she's typing so we don't lose him. Activating ellipsis. So, the suggestion here is that a social media algorithm is making a decision in this moment to send an ellipsis to Ben in order to grab his attention. In our world, the non-social dilemma world, that's just like clearly not how this works. The thing that shows that someone's typing on a messaging platform shows up every time someone's typing unless you've like turned it off in your settings or something. The ellipsis is a design choice, and it is a choice that I'd say encourages an addictive relationship with technology. But it's a choice made by tech companies, not by a machine learning algorithm. In our universe, that is. So the use of the Vincents here obscures the agency of designers, and it also totally obscures the agency of Ben and Rebecca themselves. Like, the reason Ben is looking at his phone, according to the framing of this scene, is not because the girl he's crushing on is texting him, it's because the algorithms showed him some punctuation marks. Then in the second clip, the Vincents are trying to get Ben to look at his phone, and Green Shirt says this. Okay, okay, so we've tried notifying him about tagged photos, invitations, current events, Events, even a direct message from Rebecca. Okay, so again, Rebecca sent this message, right? Why are we acting like the algorithms are in charge of determining which direct messages Ben gets to see? It's this flattening of all technologically mediated interactions into solely the work of social media algorithms. So anyway, the big drama starts when the family is all sitting down to dinner. Oh, and there's also their stepdad, Frank, by the way. I forgot to mention him before because he's pretty much completely irrelevant to the narrative, but he's there too sometimes. And earlier, the mom saw an ad on TV for a kitchen safe to lock up your cookies so you can't eat them for a set period of time, which gives her an idea. I was um, thinking we could use all five senses to enjoy our dinner tonight, so I decided that we're not gonna have any cell phones at the table tonight. They will be safe in here until after dinner, and everyone can just chill out, okay? There's some awkward silence as they don't know what to talk about. The mom wants to believe that the problem is their phones, but maybe the problem is that this family just doesn't know how to talk to each other. And then Isla absolutely loses it and smashes the kitchen safe with a wrench to get her phone back because she has so many snips to send. Her parents just don't understand that snipping is a part of who she is. If you can't love my snips, you can't love me, okay mom? Isla cracked Ben's screen in this incident, so his mom makes a bet with him that if he's able to leave his phone in the kitchen and not use it for a week, 
she'll buy him a new screen. The next day, he's bored out of his mind, doing absolutely nothing in his room for two and a half hours. You know you have books on your dresser, right? Like, I assume you had those there on purpose? Also, he's established as an affluent suburban teen, and I feel like there's probably a computer he could use in the house somewhere. Though I'm actually sort of convinced that there are no computers in the Social Dilemma cinematic universe. There's never one on screen. It never seems to occur to Ben that there could be other ways to get on the internet. The one time it's suggested that there could be other ways to get online is in this exchange. Cass, no one's forcing you to get one. You can stay disconnected as long as you want. Hey, I'm connected without a cell phone, okay? I'm on the internet right now. We don't see any device, though, and I've looked through other clips to establish the layout of their house, and it seems like she's just sitting on the couch where they usually watch TV. So my theory is that she's just so disconnected that she thinks TV is the internet. There is one brief scene with their mom on an iPad, but that's just a jumbo-sized cell phone, you know? Anyway, on day two of not having a phone, Ben goes to a natural history museum and just stares at this chimp. Like, he just really feels like he can relate to the chimp now, because the chimp doesn't have a cell phone either. Meanwhile, the algorithms are freaking out. Where is he? Why isn't he using his phone? Let's switch to resurrection mode. And then we get to a scene that I absolutely adore. It's three days into the bet, and the algorithms are really getting desperate. So they try a last-ditch effort. What about user 0126592310? Yeah, ben loved all of her posts. For months, and like literally all of them, and then nothing. I calculate a 92.3% chance of resurrection with a notification about Anna. Ben goes down to the kitchen late at night for a glass of water, and of course, the algorithm somehow sense that he's there and timed the notification perfectly because your phone can just sense when you're nearby, apparently. Let's just go with it. And they notify him that his ex-girlfriend is dating someone else. The way this moment is portrayed is so bizarre to me. Like, this is a human thing that's happening, right? It's easy to imagine the same basic scene playing out in a pre-social media movie, where a teen boy learns that his ex-girlfriend, who he's clearly not over, is dating someone else and stays up late feeling sad and maybe listening to the mixtapes that she gave him or looking at photo albums. But no. This is not normal. According to The Social Dilemma, what Ben is going through is the result of some powerful magic. In fact, the thing that initiated his night of sadness is not even his ex-girlfriend's new relationship at all, it's the mystical algorithm deciding to show it to him. I mean, just listen to the music selection here. I put a spell on you. Cause you're mine. When Cass sees Ben the next morning, lying in bed, not ready for school, with his phone in his hand, she doesn't ask if he's okay, she doesn't ask what's wrong, she just seems vaguely irritated with him for losing the bed and using his phone. The emotional content of what he was looking at is treated as completely irrelevant. And of course, this evening of cell phone relapse is also what starts Ben down the rabbit hole in his radicalization to the extreme center. We could talk about the uh, extreme center wackos I drove oh, by today. please, what? Frank, I don't want to talk about politics. Okay, we need to talk about the extreme center. The dangerous political force threatening the foundations of liberal democracy. I was all ready to agree with their analysis. I have problems with the extreme center too. I personally love socialism. But no, the extreme center is the movie's way of depicting political extremism while seeming nonpartisan. It's both the far right and the far left. They're not picking a side. The problem that the documentary is trying to highlight is polarization. Because of social media, we're all in our own separate filter bubbles, seeing different realities, unable to understand each other. Which leads to the rise of dangerous groups like the extreme center. What's wrong with the extreme center? See, he didn't even get it! It depends on who you ask. It's like asking what's wrong with propaganda. Yeah, so none of that addressed Ben's question at all. What is wrong with the extreme center? What do they even stand for? Well, the movie mostly avoids giving any concrete answers to that question, instead favoring incredibly vague nonsense. Nine out of ten people are dissatisfied right now. The EC is like any other political movement in history when you think about it. We are standing up and we are, we are standing up to this noise. But what I can glean from it is this. They believe that high school teachers are lying to us. They believe that you shouldn't vote. They believe that climate change is a hoax. 
maybe? When I first watched this movie, I understood the Extreme Center as saying that climate change was a hoax. There's this Extreme Center video Ben watches in one scene titled, Climate Change? Yeah, I don't think so. But then I listened more closely to what this vlogger Mark is actually saying, and I don't really know what's going on here. Climate change? Yeah. It's a hoax. Yeah, it's real. That's the point. The more they talk about it, and the more they divide us, the more they have the power. I've watched this clip like 20 times. It's indecipherable to me. Climate change? Yeah, it's real. Yeah, it's a hoax. That's the point. What? Also the jump cuts? Yeah. They're really weird. My best interpretation is that Mark is just essentially saying, who even gives a shit if climate change is real or a hoax? It's too divisive, and powerful people are benefiting from that division, so we should simply stop talking about it. And that seems to be essentially the message at the extreme center's center. Powerful people are creating division with their lies, so we need to join together and stop voting. Voting is tearing the country apart. But there's a curious dissonance here between the movie's actually centrist politics and its caricature of extreme center radicals. Because the extreme center is portrayed as bad and dangerous, but their message is essentially the message of the documentary, too. Social media is manipulating us. It's dividing us with misinformation. It's making us turn on each other. So what does the social dilemma want us to think is actually wrong? with the extreme center. One reading is that the extreme center claims that it's powerful people who are responsible for dividing us. But according to the movie, no, it's not people at all, it's Vincent's. I mean, when yellow shirt Vincent Carthizer puts ads in Ben's feed, that money is just going directly to him, the personified villainous algorithm, right? It's not going to the friendly tech executives who have made some mistakes but ultimately want the best for us. No, we're not being divided by powerful people or corporate corporations or the drive for profit, we're being divided by technology. That exclusive focus on technology as the source of division is necessary because in the framing of this story, politicization is always bad. Ben eventually goes to an extreme center protest, and to show that this protest is a scary, destructive thing, it's intercut with clips of real protests, primarily far-right protests from around the world. The documentary, though, was released on Netflix in September 2020, shortly after the summer in which a wave of Black Lives Matter protests spread throughout the United States. That was the most prominent image of protest at the time of the movie's release, but there's no indication in the movie that a protest movement, mobilized largely through social media, could ever have the potential to be good. Cass is worried about her brother and goes looking for him, Ben is pushed to the ground by another protester, and then they're both handcuffed and detained by the police. It's worth noting that Cass and Ben don't seem to have done anything illegal. Ben was standing up after having been knocked down by another protester, and Cass pretty much just got out of her car. It seems to me that the biggest problem here is the police. But of course, that's not what the movie wants us to think. There's obviously no historical or political context about the rise of the extreme center or the role of policing in this universe. Instead, the scene is just framed as the natural conclusion of Ben's moral degradation by social media. There are no social problems problems only cell phone problems. Within the narrative, the reason repeatedly given for why the extreme center is bad is simply that it's propaganda. I mean, you're always talking about how messed up everything is, so are they. But that stuff is just propaganda. And this reason strikes me as pretty meaningless, telling us that the problem is propaganda as a concept rather than the messages promoted through it. Like, all throughout the documentary, we see characters influenced by media in ways that the movie takes no issue with. Their mom is influenced by The View and by kitchen safe commercials. Cass is influenced by books like The Age of Surveillance Capitalism. I mean, the social dilemma itself is a pretty on-the-nose piece of documentary propaganda. The the distinction, of course, is that the propaganda Ben is watching is being recommended to him by his cell phone social media algorithms. And again, millions of people have been recommended this very documentary because of Netflix's recommendation algorithms. And I mean, I personally don't think that makes The Social Dilemma an inherently bad and evil propagandistic force brainwashing its helpless passive viewers. But I sort of think that's what the movie's narrative is telling us. In the fictional world of The Social Dilemma, 
the content of our media, the content of our politics, and the content of our lives just don't matter. Ben's emotions about his breakup don't matter, Rebecca texting him doesn't matter, his family dynamics don't matter, the profit motive of social media companies doesn't matter, substantive political conflicts don't matter. The only thing of any real consequence is the overwhelming magical power of our cell phones. Wow, great video. I just wish I had some way to explore these themes further by reading a book about the internet. Well, lucky for you, I've put together a shelf on bookshelf.org. Sh shop. Book sh big bookshop. Bookshop.org with some books about the internet, including The Age of Surveillance Capitalism, uh, which, ca uh, Cass, okay.